Yeah, and uh, first of all, I want to thank the organizers for making this possible to share my ideas and to present what I did about Berlin. That's actually not what I'm doing now as a visiting over here. I'm moving to other topics, but uh, you know, what I present here is actually based on a book, a research for a book that just came out last year at the Green in Berlin, which is about uh, the urban ecology and the relationships between politics, nature, and uh, scientific expertise. And these are also the main uh, topics that fig will figure in my talk. To start with, uh, I hope this works, no, uh, I want to show you this picture, which is taken from an uh, advertisement poster of the film Metropolis by Fritz Lang in 1927. And what you see here, in a way, encapsulates the way how in modernity we used to think of cities, cities as a very artificial environment, concrete and stone and glass and iron, but uh, nothing of what we are used to call nature. Although those who have seen the film might know that uh, some gardens are also in this metropolis, although it's very difficult to tell from this poster where they might actually be located. But th that's how we used to think of cities, or have, have used to think of cities for a long time, something opposed to nature. And nature is more something in the countryside, and that's also where conservationists were very much chosen from uh, uh, to preserve uh, landscapes and uh, rural areas as something more natural than these cities. This does not, this opposition does not necessarily mean that the city was seen as something bad, also embraced this uh, artificialness as something good, it's opening up new possibilities, but it was seen as the opposite to the natural, at least to nature nature conservation. And, uh, but this is not always the case. So here I uh, uh, show you this picture, which is as in German, it's taken from the booklet from the Berlin Senate, which is the Central Political Administration in Berlin, where it announces its new species protection program, its biodiversity program. Uh, the title is Berlin, a community of uh, humans, animals, and plants. Sounds almost literary. And what they say there is, quote, in Berlin West, there are about 1.9 million people living, and probably more than 20,000 animals and plant species. Among the latter are about uh, 200 species of wild fern blossom plants, more than 50 mammal species, about 270 bird species, 12 amphibians, and six reptile species. Furthermore, they include algae, lichen, mosses, spiders, beetles, butterflies, dragonflies, fish, and a lot more. The entire city, the developed and the undeveloped area, as well as the open landscape, is covered by a network of biotopes which may be widely tied in some places, but also rather tied, uh, less tied in other concerns. So that's how these planners of biodiversity protection were then conceived of the city. Not something that is devoid of nature, but where nature is abundant, we have all kinds of different species living there, and the biotope as a <coughs> term of this project is the area in which certain assemblages of plants and animals live together in a certain non-biotic environment. And uh, so this is a very different view. The, here we see nature as uh, something as part of the city. And indeed also other authors like David Harvey uh, in the book that he wrote about New York as being, yeah, there's nothing unnatural in New York. So, so the idea that even a city was all the concrete and the glass, you can see this as something natural, maybe nature in, in different uh, artificially programmed forms. But what I'm interested here is not so much in extending the category of nature so far, but more at looking what these conservationists and ecologists in the city who wrote this program, what they actually did with the category of nature. I'm interested in what nature as a cultural and political category, not necessarily only the very term nature, 
but the broader semantic feel around nature. Nature is sometimes what may be called green, landscape. These terms are sometimes used interchangeably. Sometimes they uh, highlight different aspects, but they form a kind of discursive landscape around which certain claims about the value of spaces are made and uh, with which certain policies have been legitimized in Berlin and also uh, uh, policy areas. And uh, the question is then, how are the boundaries of such natures? How are they defined, how they are maintained and contested? And also, how do they materialize in institutional practices and social material arrangements? And I want to use Berlin, or more precisely West Berlin, a little bit I will also talk about Berlin after the unification, but in particular West Berlin as an example, and it will become clear later on during my talk why this is a very special example. And what, uh, it's not just because I had happened to live there, but it also makes uh, some sense uh, to use it as an example because it's in a way an extreme case for studying cases are sometimes helpful to uh, shed light on uh, issues also of a wider importance. So in order to study this, uh, I use, uh, so I'm interested in the, this uh, development of the category of the biotope and how it became materialized and used to define nature and non-natures in cities. And I use uh, as a kind of structuring device the term of a nature relief or the biotope protection regime, more specifically, as this new spatial political formation that came into being in the uh, 1970s and 80s in particular. The term regime is, has been used widely in all kinds of social areas, ecological regime, the, the urban regime, different ways in which Michel Foucault uses the regime notion, political about environmental regimes like the Kyoto regime and things like that. Well, uh, I, uh, my, uh, yet the term nature regime, as I used it, had also been used before by a development uh, anthropologist, Arturo Escobar, but he defined it in a slightly different way in order to distinguish between different, very general stances of uh, societies or cultures to nature. So for him, Western industrial societies are characterized by more in, uh, uh, tendency to uh, see uh, nature in abstract uh, categories that you can calculate and manipulate what he calls the capitalist nature regime, which he contrasts to an uh, organic nature regime of the non-Western countries. And then there's also the notion of the technological regime, but that's more about what biotechnology and These are very broad categories. I use the term here a little bit differently to shed light on the systematic nature in which, uh, yeah, in which nature is organized as an object of public concern and contestation. As I define it here, a nature regime is a dynamic set of relationships that include first the portions of the non-human world that are claimed to represent valuable forms of nature not just valuable forms of nature. Second, the practices and discourses through which such claims are produced, promoted, and incorporated into public policies. And third, also the individuals, collectives, institutions that assemble around and sponsor these claims. So uh, you know, using the term regime in such a way has some advantages uh, compared to other can conceptual candidates so you, uh, you could talk about this of course also in terms of uh, uh, the urban movement, but the movement is more the civic civil society part. You will have problems conceptually to also include aspects that happen once a person is institutionalized, when their agenda has become adopted by the official planning system. So, but for planning systems, you have to Theories of governance, of uh, uh, policy making. Well, the, the advantage of uh, the nature regime concept is just that 
he said how I want to use it to look more at the interrelations and the coming together of all these different strands of social and discursive practice into an overall uh, political formation. And secondly, and that's also different to um, traditional, at least traditional uh, concept here, maybe more in line to actor network theory and other more than human uh, theories, that I want to include also the materiality of the, the nature, the, the object, the spaces that are claimed to it. Not just as something that in a trivial sense is, is of course what these people are talking about, but something that is engaged by these discourses and practices in a specific way. And that's the spaces that are sticky in a way, also in a blend of specific landscapes, these discourses are and cannot easily disconnect from them. Maybe you can, but this requires a kind of other work of standardization to do that and decontextualization. But first of all, this is very uh, sticky on the ground of what these concepts of discourse have been uh, developed and with which the law is to constantly engage and transform. Uh, yeah, uh, so what I want to show now uh, is how this biotope protection regime has emerged in Berlin and what this does to maintain what, what nature is and what nature is. And my argument is that this, uh, that we can understand the emergence such a biotope protection regime as the conjuncture of three historical local trajectories. One is ecologies turn to the city as a, as a central fieldwork site. The second trajectory is the expansion of landscape planning to the city and the rise of uh, environmental activism, uh, which uh, goes, uh, and the first part is, is really changed in the planning system of the uh, city, so the landscape planning became part of urban planning. And uh, all these three uh, developments, I see them as, as, not, as coming together in a very specific local environment, something that has to do with a specific constellation of West Berlin, the political division of the city in 1948 already, but then also the wall, Island character of West Berlin, and that's why I'm also putting I'm focusing specifically on West Berlin. In East Berlin, we have very different uh, uh, circumstances, uh, but I argue that this form of urban ecology developed in West Berlin, and later, of course, also uh, uh, expanded to other uh, parts of Berlin, as many other policies and administrative structures were in uh, West Berlin. Uh, I call this talk not the invention of nature, but the reinvention of urban nature. Because what I call the urban biotope regime is not the first way to create and to organize nature as an object of public contestation. Before that, there have been other nature regimes. For example, the, yeah, the, green, green, the regime of green planning, the creation of parks in the city for more uh, primarily for humanity issues, not so much for biotech protection and for biodiversity, but just to create uh, green areas for people to go to during the weekends and uh, to, you know, to guarantee that they have fresh air in the city. These were the motives. But around this all kinds of act uh, yes, all civil society administrators and citizens already emerged since the early, uh, late 19th century, which also materialized in the geography of Berlin and all kinds of park landscapes. And you have the classical nature conservation regime, which uh, focuses more on rural areas, but there, also at the fringe of the city, there are some bogs and some, some forests, where also even in uh, West Berlin, uh, conservationists were active uh, protect them. And this regime uh, goes also back to late 19th century with the 
early picture conservation, a monument conservation, nature monument to the German farm for that. So very much close to a cultural heritage, actually. But it was around the city. It was also promoted at some point by <coughs> city dwellers can go uh, on the weekends, and in particular those from the educated class who are able to, to read nature and understand the uh, value of this behavior. And then you had a, had a very special regime, more organic urbanism in the post-war period. It was the idea that uh, you know, when, because the cities were destroyed, that this was a chance to rebuild them uh, in a much more open structure, very much in line with general uh, progress of uh, modernist uh, urbanism, but uh, with, with a specific organic touch. Uh, the idea was to integrate uh, the natural with death and the river Basang, the land, for example, to make the city a kind of organic whole that is connected to the natural landscape around it. Again, a very different take to uh, what nature is. But I will not expand on these other nature regimes here, so because my topic is more the one uh, that came into being in the, uh, West Berlin in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, but I just want to make clear uh, that uh, it builds on some traditions that were already in place there. So let me come to the first trajectory, what I call ecologies to the city. Ecology as a discipline or sub-discipline in biology has already existed since uh, 1866 when Ernst Haeckel coined the term ecology and since the time the dissertation scientists and animal ecologists used it and developed all kinds of ecological concepts. But the institutionalization of ecology as a politically visible and wider uh, relevant field happened in particular in the 1960s and 70s, notably through various international programs like the International Biological Program, Man at the Biosphere Program, uh, the Intercol, <coughs> the International Professional Organization of the Ecologists that was founded then, also in Germany, the Gesellschaft für Ökologie, Society, Association for Ecology. And, uh, but these ecologists were mostly interested in uh, non-urban ecosystems, maritime systems, in the rainforest, in uh, savanna nature, and things like that. But some already, in, in particular in this man and the biosphere program, there was already a sub-program of metropolitan ecosystems. So there was something happening, like also the turn of ecologists away from their traditional took the city as another field and object of study. And uh, Berlin, in a way, was the center of this urban turn to ecology. It also happened somewhere else, but in a very uh, dense, a very dynamic way in West Berlin, not in East Berlin, West Berlin. And uh, this has to do with various local uh, reasons. One is that it's not so special of Berlin, you have it as well, but it was part of the story. And there was the long-standing tradition of regional uh, natural history. You had all kinds of associations, of botanical associations, specific uh, associations devoted to the study of animals. And they uh, went out to the forests in the area, but also to some of the parks in the city. And they uh, inventorized the, uh, the populations of certain plants and animals. These were largely amateurs, but also some uh, people were university botanists sometimes joined them. But it was more a semi-academic network of researchers. But they uh, maintained a constant stock of knowledge of urban wildlife, not urban, but re local, regional wildlife in this area around Berlin. And they, they were very important for that. And, uh, but then in uh, 1952, that was a little bit before the war in 61 was built, there already for the inhabitants of West Berlin were no longer allowed to assess uh, the, 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 you know, the GDR, the, uh, the East German country. Uh, 
countryside around it. And these have been just the uh, observation <coughs> grounds of all these naturalists. So they could either stop uh, natural botanizing or, and that's what they did, they concentrated on what was left to them within this, uh, in the territory of West Berlin. And that's what they actually did. And there were some forests and some rocks, as I said, but also very urban areas that they then started to study. And they, they, they were also uh, very interested, and they also boosted this research. It's not that they also were happy that they still found some box which happened to be uh, uh, in the territory of West Berlin. They also found new other interesting areas there. And that's because of the war. Berlin was heavily bombed, and uh, in contrast to many West German cities, the pace of redevelopment was very slow there because it was an economically very marginal city, and so you had lots of rubble areas, abandoned lots, and uh, all kinds of uh, plants, animals came in, and they guarded there and developed new uh, types of vegetation, and that, uh, yeah, and these uh, naturalists, they were fascinated by that, they used to study that. You had to get that after the war also in other cities, but in Berlin you had a very large city, where for a long time uh, these areas remained undeveloped. And for a long time they could study the development of the vegetation in these areas. Another point that added to this momentum of the urban turn in ecology was the administrative demand for expertise, which is such you know, somewhere else as well. But also in Berlin it was very much fostered because of this island situation, protecting green for those people who could not leave the city it was a, had a very high priority. It was relatively easy to argue uh, for that compared to other cities. There was also not only, uh, yeah, in all political parties in a way, so there was a consensus that green should be protected. And in the 50s, 60s, it was even framed and called war vocabulary that by green in Berlin, the outpost uh, in the east should be strengthened. Uh, this kind of discourse was even mobilized. To so green was uh, figured very prominently here uh, on the agenda, and uh, that allowed also uh, experts of ecology to get into that and uh, to work as expert advisors for uh, policies in this area. And all this, in a way, came together and was further boosted by the institutionalization of ecology at the technical university And uh, there was uh, the founded, there was a former agricultural institute, but at that time the idea that there were no ideas that you need agriculture in the city back then. So the idea was it's silly to have an agricultural faculty in the city. We have to turn it into a broad ecological institute, and that's what they did. And these people who were hired, in particular Herbert Sukov, were very important for uh, staking out domain for what they call urban ecology in Berlin, in teaching, uh, also in doing research. And thereby they transformed Berlin, this small city island, into their main research object, into the laboratory of urban ecology. Here you see Herbert Zukov in around 1960 in a uh, rubble area abandoned <coughs> it's in the district of Tiergarten. You see some factory buildings and uh, residential buildings in the back. So this was really in the city, and he, wa he went there, and his colleagues did that, just uh, uh, studying these plants. Uh, uh, he was not so much interested in animals as a botanist. Here you see the same plot uh, in 1978, when uh, uh, ecology was already institutionalized at the university. This was uh, one of the uh, annual student practical courses where students learn to how to study vegetation. And here they do a sample plat analysis of the so called radular vegetation, as how they call it, in such uh, rubble areas. 
So uh, field work in the city, that, that, uh, that was the main thing that triggered, uh, that characterized the college here, and which also uh, distinguished this specific style of doing ecology in Berlin from those in other countries, or in particular uh, people working on uh, metropolitan regions and ecosystems in the Man uh, of the Biosphere program that I mentioned before, they were very much uh, not thinking in lines of the formalized ecosystem approach. If one sees such cities as machineries of uh, energy and material flows with cybernetic models, very quantitative, and they didn't do so much actual field work. So uh, these were often just theoretical models of how cities uh, were conceived of. And uh, for uh, Zukov <coughs> and this group in Berlin, this approach was not so relevant. They started from the direct experience of studying uh, plants, in particular plant and vegetation, in these patches in the city, and in, in a way turned their handicap of being locked into Berlin into an asset to create a very specific uh, brand of urban ecology. And the main field work sites on which they concentrated were, of course, the nature reserves that were still part of West Berlin, some box, what they called uh, islands, smallest islands in the hostile environment of the city. And uh, there they studied in particular the vulnerability of these uh, ecosystems in the city, which is a, you know, a little bit more traditional way of how you might think of the relationship between city and nature. What was much more important for developing this stance on and this view of nature as something that is community of humans, plants, and animals, that was more what they learned in these rubble areas, the, also in the areas, abandoned railway areas, when they studied the succession, uh, the temporal development of different uh, formations <coughs> of vegetation through time, and yeah, what they called the ruggedo flora. And it was interesting that this was not just green, like outside of the city. What was so surprising there was that these were completely new types of vegetation that did not fit into the established taxonomies of vegetation types that had been developed in forests and other in meadows and outside of the city. Very new things. There was a new species came in there. Species that usually cannot survive in, uh, in this part of the world. That were more from the Mediterranean, which needed much warmer climate. But in the city, they had a warmer climate. And the city was connected to the world by railway traffic exchange of goods, and all these mobilities brought in new seeds that assembled in patches in the city and turned them into systemically exciting places for these ecologists. Also parks, they looked at parks, but their engagement with parks was just very different from that of horticulturists. Horticulturists wanted to shape visual scenery make the park resemble the landscape outside of the city. That was nature for them. But for these ecologists, nature was just you know, that you needed to have certain amounts of certain kinds of species there. And they often criticized also horticulturalist-minded uh, garden officials for doing that for these uh, parks, because they often, in order to maintain visual sceneries, that uh, they had to uh, take out uh, what the uh, weeds, uh, or these ecologists' weeds were just rather rural plants which belonged to the urban ecosystem and characterized this vegetation. And uh, what they also did, in particular in the around 1980, was an extension of their ecological gaze to the built up area. Zukov developed this idea of the city as a biotope of uh, the mosaic of biotopes. The idea was that everything that you find in a city is to some extent for some animals, for some plants, it is a biotope. It has a characteristic uh, vegetation in which can also be enhanced. So the idea was that you can make it better by somehow rebuilding all these different patches to make them even more attractive for more plants and animals. And this 
was where the modest descriptive idea of the bias will slowly move into enormously complex. And because this is a bias group, we also have to treat it as such and make these biotopes more valuable. This is how Zukov described the city uh, as a kind of zooming uh, in different uh, ecological areas with different vegetation but also other environmental factors. This is a map that uh, an expert advisory group on the, uh, with Zukov uh, produced uh, for this biotope, uh, for this uh, biotope protection program, the so-called bio, so-called biotope mapping, in 1983, and there you see all kinds. Of, basically, these are land use areas. It's based on a land use map, but it is recoded here. And for, uh, for example, uh, land use areas, you, you have parklands, but they are recoded and, uh, and described as a specific biotope. Or you have even biotope types like uh, industrial areas or uh, development, uh, five story building development from the 1990s as a biotope type with char characteristic gardens, characteristic leaves in these gardens, uh, birds that we usually find there. And the idea was that each of these land use types is a very specific biotope that requires a very specific uh, ways of care in uh, urban planning. So that was the first trajectory of the transformation of the city into a fieldwork site, and through the uh, practical engagement with these uh, plants and animals there, also the reframing of this as a set of biotopes uh, with all kinds of descriptive and normative implications that this had. The second uh, trajectory was the rise of urban environmentalism, environmental activism in the city, which includes on the one hand professional activism, professionals who, real, who, who are part of uh, campaigns for protecting nature in the city, as well as a more civic kind of activism. Professional activism includes Zukov and other ecologists from the faculty. They also became active politically. Now, was some self-interest because uh, in the 80s and 70s already all kinds of new development projects were launched in Berlin and discussed. And these ecologists, they feared that they would lose their uh, main research objects and they wanted to defend it because they had already followed the development of vegetation there for 20, 30 years. And they wanted to continue to see what would happen in another 10 years and 20 years. They wanted to keep these areas uh, free from development to use them as scientific laboratories for their disciplines. So they were very important in this activism. You had also landscape planning profession, which evolved there. And in particular, students from landscape planning, they were often uh, also kind of involved in expert activist coalitions surrounding land use conflicts where areas that were framed as biotopes were uh, Topic. Civic activism, you had traditional nature conservation uh, organizations, which also slowly jumped on this bandwagon. But in particular, you had a new phenomenon in the 1970s in Germany, which was the rise of so called Bürgerinitiativen, citizen initiatives. These were uh, largely informal activist groups of neighborhoods that were fighting against certain development projects, often also because they. Uh, um, now feared that uh, new traffic would come in, that we would lose uh, green spaces that was <coughs> necessary for recreation. But they also jumped on the bandwagon of biotope protection because by framing these areas as biotopes, they, uh, they could strengthen their uh, political claim and uh, form alliances with these ecologists and landscape planners around it. So this is very important. To, uh, to give political uh, momentum to this uh, urban ecology, which otherwise would have just remained a purely academic uh, project. Here you see uh, already in the biotope how it became a contested issue. It was a, a struggle against a power plant in an urban forest, uh, which is part of Berlin. This was not a nuclear power plant. 
It was just a conventional uh, one, but uh, it was not about risks. It was about uh, this, uh, yeah, this uh, forest that uh, citizens and ecologists wanted to protect. And they used ecological arguments that it is a biotope. Here, uh, this was uh, uh, in the 1990s, conflict around uh, close down our former railway area, the Gleisdreieck, which now is transformed into a park. You will see it later. You see activists uh, putting posters there. And uh, so, so here you see how nature is all, or engaged in all kinds of uh, political uh, contests. What also was part of this politicization of nature was the evolution of, of assembling new aesthetic attitudes. It would be characterized as a new political aesthetic of urban wilderness. So activists, <coughs> and also the experts that joined this coalition, they uh, cherished these areas as kind of wild, unregulated landscapes where the weeds the weak vocabulary was not politically correct to use it in this context. So these were all the wild flowers, wild plants, and, and these sceneries were embraced. And these kind of visual representations, which you saw in booklets and all kinds of and, uh, photo exhibitions, films uh, that they produced, thereby they, they promoted this positive uh, aesthetics, and thereby, in a way, uh, try to turn around the dominant aesthetics in which these were seen as uh, uh, landscapes of decay, of uh, derelict landscapes, but for them this was something that they should cherish at the end of state. Also not by transforming that into some sort of urban garden, but not in that way as it developed uh, spontaneously. And uh, I will not read this to you, but they also, uh, also all kinds of narratives, uh, how, how the, uh, these areas can be preserved, uh, so can be experienced, which in a way were also functioned as uh, guidelines and scripts for other people to visit these areas and to experience them in a similar way and uh, enjoy them. And also excursions were used to bring people and to learn them to see and to appreciate uh, nature in the city in this way. Uh, let me shortly come to a third, pre third uh, trajectory that was uh, the changes in the planning system. That was one was a certain a kind of master plan for the protection of plants and animals that was created in Berlin on the base on, of the map that I uh, showed you before. So each of these different <coughs> land use types, which were framed as biotopes, very specific measures were proposed. This was not realized it was severe and there and more. But on paper it was, and that was a very important resource also for later land uh, use conflicts for, uh, for activists to mobilize it. And then here and there it was also realized. Then uh, you had the encroachment regulation. That was a regulation in the, also the new nature conservation law uh, in 19, in, which was implemented in Berlin in 1979, according to which, when you uh, where you have to avoid uh, that valuable nature is destroyed by any project, by any intervention, any encroachment, whatever, building houses, whatever. But if it happens for higher public reasons, it is considered that you have to do it, it is necessary not to do it, then you have to compensate for it. You which means you have to somewhere else recreate the nature or make this ecosystem somewhere else a little bit better. And that's what happened in particular after uh, the fall of the wall and the west from along the island, when you had lots of development pressure. It was no longer possible to keep all kinds of areas as uh, wastelands in the city. Like here, this is the former, what's now the Potsdamer Platz area, which was one of the attractive wastelands for uh, conservationists and ecologists, but it was not, it was in really the center now of the new geography of Berlin. It was impossible to protect uh, that. And uh, what happened there, that's how it looks like now. 
And in fact, what also happened is, uh, was a compensation of this uh, encroachment by building a new park at the Gleisgleis, uh, which is already a tricky thing because, as, as we have seen before, this was already a regular biotope that was, uh, was already people wanted to protect it, and now it was created as a park. Here you see the ambivalence also of this encroachment policy. With, uh, here, if an area was used as compensation and, and, uh, that already had been quite natural, but uh, the argument was there that uh, officially uh, in the past it had been still a railway area because it was earmarked as such on the land use plan. And by shifting the formal status to a park, it was uh, it served the compensation purpose. But many activists were against that. And in particular, the horticultural <coughs> management of the park, uh, they considered that as a distraction of nature because they removed all the federal vegetation that was there, which to some extent actually had already been happen, happened because this area had been used as a logistics center for the construction works that happened at the nearby Potsdamer Platz before. So when, when they constructed this part, so not that much of the federal biotope had been left. Uh, so there are all kinds of uh, issues involved in negotiating these compen uh, compensatory packages. I don't want to into detail here, but uh, what uh, happened is that because due to this, uh, the institutionalization also of this nature conservation agenda in different uh, planning instruments, here and there, this project also proved successful. One example is this nature park Südgelände, uh, and there indeed a nature park was formed where the actual nature was integrated are still the spontaneous plants and vegetation that you saw before. This is the same site with the water tower. But what you also see is some you know, landscape artists, architects added some artsy elements to it, which, as you can imagine, was also very much contested among different stakeholders. So uh, uh, yeah, before the uh, last uh, thing that I'll shortly want to dire uh, direct your attention to is that yeah, on the one hand, there emerged this nature conservation. But nature conservation regimes are never stable <coughs> like processes. They are full of internal ambivalences. And some of them, of these conflicts, tensions, and limitations in the nature biotope uh, protection regime, will be, of course, the direct competition with urban planning priorities. The, the example of the Potsdamer Platz, where there was a lot of power for using that for redevelopment. But also competition with other nature regimes. If you, you saw, yeah, that sometimes you saw that the park was uh, first it was uh, it was a campaign to protect it as a radial area, but in the end uh, some aesthetic elements were included. So it's a different idea. It's just uh, aspects from the traditional urban uh, green planning regime how to create a nice place of amenity were in competition there with a new biotope audience led to compromises, but also political struggles. Bringing the, yeah, I don't want to go into all the details here because we don't have so much time, but what is one, uh, you know, maybe one important thing is also, it's the, the idea is bringing nature into the city and considering the entire nature, the entire city as nature, that's what these ecologists did, and uh, in particular in the Programmatic statement that I read out in the beginning. But at the same time, we also create, hier recreate hierarchies between more natural and less natural places in the city. So all the nature, the, the open city is biotope. It's a network of biotopes everywhere. But rural areas are more valuable, more authentic to the nature in the city than the others. And uh, another is a dynamic interpretation of nature. It's a question that's always going on. On the other hand, they had to align this with the need of creating a parcelization of land into patches uh, for which specific uh, planning uh, dispositives could be formulated. And the yeah, differences between expert claims making and civic claims making, and expert uh, uh, 
specifically for missions, the, the emerge there. I could give some examples if I had more time for that. Yeah, uh, well, let me uh, come to the conclusion. So what we can say is that in the 1970s and 1980s, of the 80s, not 80 only, Berlin had been an experimental field for new approaches to urban nature. And this was due to these three trajectories. And they all had uh, their uh, specific dynamics and created new interrelations that were not so specific to the city. Each of the single elements, you find easily find other cities where this also happened, but they came together here and created a fertile ground for a specific, dense, and relatively not uh, successful, but what for a long time stable uh, nature regime to come into being. And this nature regime, when we look at it, what's important is also, on the one hand, it is in place or in space, it is part of urban space, it thrives on the particularities of that place, but at the same time, it also recreates and creates new spaces, such as we have seen at the Südkorn And, uh, but the other point is what I uh, thought we uh, showed you at the end, is that these, uh, this nature regime is also full of internal tensions, which can be seen as something bad, but I would see these tensions more as something of having also a, a kind of you know, positive political potential. Working with these tensions might create new, exciting dynamics for ex further experimentation with nature. And where, on the one hand, you always find in, uh, tendencies to re-essentialize consider some natures as more uh, urban nature than others in a, in a way to uh, distinguish uh, uh, certain areas of nature, uh, uh, reserves, distinguish from high uh, intensity and land use areas, which often, to some extent, seems to flip back into traditional opposition between city and the city, and somehow re-enters them in the city at the same time because these tensions remain there, which lead to all kinds of discussions, it leads in a way to a constant reflexive, reflexive reflectivity of nature. What we define as nature is something that can no longer be read off of certain uh, essential features of what is out there in space, but that is something that is negotiated. And maybe uh, this will lead us to something that could be called as an ironic nature. And nature I, I, I take this use, uh, use of ironic from Richard Rohe's work, where he said that it's ironic in the sense of being aware that what you do is very contingent, everything could be otherwise, but still you do it, and you can play with it in a specific way. And maybe that uh, uh, this is one of the ways in which uh, uh, engagement with the complexities and the ambivalence of the uh, complex urban nature works back on our basic understanding of what nature is, is that if we still can use this category of nature at all, it still has political values, it will be 